Hey everybody, Larry Powell here at Studio HFL, and my guest tonight is Mark Baselli. Uh, but before we get to Mark, just a quick shout out to the show sponsors. Of course, you can see that on the screen here, Eastman Music, uh, S.E. Shires, Carl Hammond Design, uh, Chop Saver, Messina Covers, Austin Custom Brass, Picket Blackburn, and you too could be a show sponsor if you go to patreon.com slash studio HFL and look at the five tiers of support there. If you wanna support the show, that would be great. Um, and let's see, I'll go to Apple Podcasts, leave a rating and a review, that would be very nice as well. And uh, Mark is here, we're kicking back off the live interview uh, series, and this is pretty cool. I've got Mark tonight and Morris Northcutt. Mark, do you know Morris? Uh, of, 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 yeah. Uh, I got Al Chez coming up from Paul Schaefer's late night yep. band. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Yari Villanueva. Uh, boy, I, I just got a great lineup coming up here. And yeah, Tony DiLorenzo. Forward yeah. Looking forward so. to hearing him. So let me get rid of this. And hey, welcome. Thanks, Larry. Hey, this might be the most we've ever talked. <laughs> the longest conversation already that you and I have ever had, probably. Uh, well, we had a conversation once about a part in the studio. Maybe, maybe something like that. But, you know, the, the, to me, the funny thing is you've been in Indy so long and I'm just, you know, we see each other, yeah, in the studio and, and here and there, but um, you're in the jazz world. Mostly. Yes, mostly. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And I'm not allowed in that world. And I'm not allowed in your world. So <laughs> that's why we don't see each other. <laughs> And I so. was allowed in that world a couple of times. And I asked, okay, who died and why am I here? <laughs> um, uh, so tell me, when did you get to Indy? How long have you been here? I moved here and I met my wife in 91 on a, uh, on a cruise ship. I moved here in 93. I got in-state residency and I did a master's at IU in 94. Oh, I didn't realize you came here to do for school. I mean, obviously you said you met Andrea. Um, yeah. And is we were, she from here? Um, originally she's from Oregon. Oh, but then, nowhere close. Nowhere close, but her parents uh, were here when I met her. So uh, we ended up here. We were all set to move. And then I met this guy named Brent Walrab and the rest is history. Yeah. Of course, we're going to talk about that a little <laughs> bit too. Right. Um, so when you got here, what was uh, what was the scene like in Indianapolis? Oh, when I got here, I knew exactly that I would not be a first call trumpet player in Indianapolis. Too many good trumpet players around. I'm one of these people that I said to myself, okay, I'm either going to have to find a different profession or I'm going to have to start my own thing. <laughs> no, really. I yeah. love, you know, and and so I went out and I... I started a big band, a 10 piece band. I started uh, uh, a sextet. I started all kinds of different working. I have a book for everything from quartet, quintet, sextet, septet, octet. Uh, nine, I have, of course, the birth of the cool. And then a 10 piece band and a big band. So, I mean, and that's what I try to impress to my students too. You're not only a trumpet player, you have to, you have, to have a little vision. Yeah. Because if you're not the first call player and you still want to play music, you got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it reminds me of a, a quote, uh, Tony Robbins. I heard this from Tony Robbins, oh. you know, the the uh, motivation guy. Yeah. He said, uh, you can either complain about uh, lack of resources or you can become resourceful. Sure. Right. And that's what you did. That's what it sounds like is you became resourceful. I did. And I caught some lucky breaks along the way. Mm -hmm. That always helps. Um, okay. I'm trying to remember some of the names of these, these bands, mid coast swing project. Was that one of yours? Yes. One of mine. We, uh, that band specializes in music from the thirties and forties with arrangements by Brent Walrab and myself. Mm -hmm. And then, um, of course we have the Sully Walrab jazz orchestra, which we've had for, 20, God, I'm 27 years now. And we're doing a new recording this summer. So that's kind of exciting. Okay, so new, what number is that? How many? 
How many would that be? Um, that'll be the 10th. The 10th Are you recording. serious? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I know, man. Yeah, know. that's terrific. So are you writing the charts for that, or both of you putting them um, together? This one, this one is Brent's. He's, um, we're doing a tribute to uh, uh, Jeanette, Star Records, Richmond, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And he's written a whole suite. So uh, I've seen some of it. It's, it's really good stuff. He's one of my favorite writers. So, um, I, You guys probably complement each other in that area, right? And yeah, I, I think he's I think he's a much better writer than I am. I'm usually the guy that handles all the business details and the mm. you know and the all that kind of stuff. Um, is business good these days? <laughs> <laughs> is you know, it getting better? Um, you know, I I managed to work a lot. I mean, I'm a guest artist for a high school this weekend. I have my own band playing a wedding on Saturday, um, guest artist on Friday. So yeah, business for me is pretty good. You know? Well, I know I things try... are slowly picking back up for everybody, but uh Yeah. Yeah. Well that's that's good to hear. Okay, so I want to go back to I was asking about the scene in Indy. And yeah. you 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 alluded to what the scene was like for trumpets. What did you see as far as jazz goes? What was going on around town during that? Oh, when I got here, you know, the trouble players said, I, and there was well, Larry Wiseman. Mm. You know, Larry Wiseman was here. Yeah. And I sat next to Larry Wiseman for, I don't know, 12 years in my band every Tuesday night. And what a, what a, what a trumpet player and what a human being. And, you know, it didn't matter. He would make you just feel so good to be there. Right. Such a special human being. And at the time, you know, um, Lenny Foy was here. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Conrad, you were here. Uh, Alan Miller. Mm -hmm. um, all these people were great trumpet players, you know. And I was uh, I was like, well, I'm not going to break into this recording. <laughs> <laughs> you know, John Rommel was here and all that, yeah. all that kind yeah. of stuff. So believe me, there's a way, though. There's a way to work yourself in. Yeah. Um, I mean, was Joey here by that point? Or he, he came no, later? No, Joey wasn't point. here. Yeah. In fact, I think, I'm pretty sure about this, but I think I got Joey his first Indianapolis gig. And I think it was, nice. I, I'm going to ask him about that, but I'm pretty sure I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Are your bands pretty much local or do you guys travel? Or do, tell me, have you toured with any of them? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we took the big band on a, on a short tour a couple of years ago um, mm -hmm. when the economy was booming. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, it was pretty nice. Um, the Mid Coast band has traveled out of state mm -hmm. um, regionally. But uh, no, we haven't done any international tours. I do all those with my Ball State band. And we're going to get to that too. Actually, let's let's go ahead and talk about that. You are is it professor of jazz studies? Is that or a director of jazz? I'm studies? the director of the jazz program at Ball State. Yep. Mm -hmm. And yeah. how long have you been there? Uh, Fifteen years, and before that, I was at Butler for eight years. Now at Ball State, you stepped into uh, it was Larry McWilliams had been doing that job, Larry right? Larry McWilliams had that gig for years. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And established a really nice program. I mean, there was already a reputation there. Yeah, Larry had, he and Frank Bazuo were the jazz faculty. So, I mean, I got a nice program from Larry. I got a really nice jazz festival date from Larry that was all set. You know, the hardest thing, you know, is to find a date for your festival. Um, I got a major started. I got six people hired on my faculty. And uh, let me tell you something, that wasn't easy. Well, and it wasn't quick either, right? And I mean, it wasn't was, quick. No, yeah. it wasn't yeah. quick. You know, the speed of school moves like slow. <laughs> right. It's like but, turning, trying to turn a cruise ship. Take, yeah. It takes a while, right? In a, in a sea of Mars bars. <laughs> um, there's a, a colleague of mine uh, taught me the term administrivia a couple of yeah. years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's like that applies to everything about college. Right. I mean, there's there's no simple way to do anything. There's, there's no simple job. I mean, unless I guess if you have like billions, you know, and you just travel, yeah. then you got to worry about your money. But I mean, there's ups and downs. 
I have a really nice program. We just came out with our very first recording. It's being released on February 25th. And uh, our CD release party is at the Jazz Kitchen on March 12th. On March 13th, we board a plane and we all go to Dizzy's in New York City uh, with guest artist Bobby Watson. And we're playing on Monday, March 14th. We come back. So we've the program is definitely on the on the upswing. Definitely. It's it's an exciting time for me to see the fruits of all this coming together. How's that band doing? I mean, this this is really the first semester that they've been probably all back together at the same yeah. time consistently, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can talk to everybody all over the country about this. I mean, they're all mm-hmm. they all went through it. You know, the one thing that the pandemic did in, in my opinion, uh, the one positive thing was that the musicians had to sit six feet apart. And I think it made them learn how to listen to each other a little bit better. Yeah. Um, especially when we did the recording in the studio, six feet apart is insane. But it worked out. Mm-hmm. We, we got it done. You know, it sounds great. We got it mixed. So how are they doing? They love being close together again. Yeah, I'm sure. Response to your question, you know. <laughs> so, is the album uh, the thing you're you're releasing? Is that what you're taking to New York? Is that what you're going to play? Um, some of it, mm-hmm. definitely some. Um, we have a vocalist, a Keely McDuffie, who's uh, done some acting work on um, Chicago Fire. Mm-hmm. She's coming along with us. She's a Ball State grad. Nice. So. And I'm taking some grad students with me because I don't know if you know the whole situation, but we were supposed to go there in 2020. Mm-hmm. And two weeks, it, that's when everything hit the fan. Mm-hmm. Got canceled. And um, we got the airlines to to have our tickets until March 21st of 2022. Mm-hmm. So we begged Dizzy's to get there before March 21st, 2020. They got us there March 14th. So, nice. Yeah. So uh, I'm just kind of curious, uh, what kind of masks, uh, mask mandate? Are, is your band going to have to wear masks while they play? Um, Dizzy's requires proof of vaccination, which is pretty mm-hmm. much everywhere you go today. And um, the mask thing, uh, you have to wear a mask inside, but mm-hmm. when you're playing, you don't. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good. Or unless you've got a beer or a drink in your hand, right? I mean, the, like, or or unless you go to the Super Bowl or you go to a big football game where you can sit around and drink beer two inches from, you know, mm-hmm. 70,000 people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah uh, that was the COVID Bowl we watched yeah. on January 1st, right? Yeah, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, okay, let's talk about, you mentioned grad students, but so you've got a... Uh, master's and doctoral program there. Yes, we have a master's and doctoral program, uh, not in jazz, just a, just an undergrad degree in jazz, but there are masters, we're talking about trumpet. So the, yes, mm-hmm. there's a master's and doctoral degree in trumpet there. Mm-hmm. And Stephen Campbell was the teacher. He's a wonderful, mm-hmm. wonderful player, wonderful person. Yeah, I, I think the world of Stephen. What a yeah, great guy. We get along so well. So that's, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, what's your student, uh, your studio load like up there? Me personally? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I get uh, I get some relief as a director. I teach uh, the classes that I teach. I, I teach the jazz theory class and I teach the arranging classes. Mm-hmm. Those are the only things that I teach. And then everyone else does something else. So I have... Um, I have like four majors right now. And mm-hmm. then I have a number of secondary lessons that I do. Mm-hmm. Jazz theory. It makes me think uh, that ties back to IU. Was it David Baker? The, was that the reason you went to IU? Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of reasons I went. Uh, my wife, did I mention my wife? Um, <laughs> I, w- I went there uh, obviously for David. Uh, da- David had a wealth of information, man. One of my favorite classes was just just to listen to him talk in, in one of the history classes. Mm-hmm. It was just, you know, endless, endless knowledge. Uh, you know, I, I never met him, 
uh, which is it's not surprising, right? I mean, I, I'm not, I wasn't in that circle, uh, but I certainly knew who he was. And there's so many people around here who, you know, came through IU and just everybody sang his praises, kind of like you were going on about Larry Wiseman, you know, right. like everybody felt the same way about uh, David Baker. Yep. Yeah. And I had come from um, before, well, a long, maybe 12 years before, I got to study uh, arranging with Herb Pomeroy at, at Berkeley. And mm -hmm. that was that was eye opening, as well. So, How? Why? Why was that? Um, Herb's way of teaching arranging was so uh, it just clicked with me. He had all this, all these, this way he looked at lines, line writing class, and mm -hmm. um, the way he looked at uh, harmonizations and uh, you know substituting chords and. His rules for for dissonance within the chord were extremely interesting to mm -hmm. somebody like me who who hear, heard that sound but didn't know really like why does it sound like that? Mm -hmm. But you were drawn to that. I was drawn to that, and I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much more drawn to like writing than than playing the trumpet in the early years. Mm -hmm. Every time I remember when I was at Berkeley, I stood next to this guy, man. Tony Garuso, and I had played with some trumpet players before in my life, but this guy, he had the fattest high A I have ever stood mm -hmm. next to. And I remember our the director, Wes Hensel, was sitting mm -hmm. up there with his arms crossed, just looking at him, you know? And and I talked to Tony afterwards. I said, what do you do? Like, how, how do you get this range? Because I've never had any range. I've had the same range on whatever I play on. And Tony goes, I play the Schlossberg a lot, right? Right. Well, here, here I go. I start doing Schlossberg religiously, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. And I hear something on the record and I go, no, man, I got to get this off the record. I got I got it. I was, I did all, all the transcribing and learning tunes back then mm -hmm. with when I should have been doing my fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So I came to fundamentals later on in life. Mm -hmm. And now that's all I preach. <laughs> Um, you know, Schlossberg's great, but one of the best resources to come along lately has been Scott Belk's oh, yeah. new book, right? Because those, make, are, those are taken from the jazz world. There's There are three books I make my students have, the Arvin's book, the Clark mm -hmm. book, and the Scott Belk flexibility book. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, they're flexibilities, but look at the little messages in there, you know? <laughs> right. He just cracks me up, man. <laughs> yeah, you should buy the book. You know, for I the was title. with... Here's a story. I was actually with Scott. We were playing a gig at the um, historical Indiana Historical Society with a mm -hmm. trumpet player at the time named John Vandergast, who's since yeah. Been. And we were playing this band, and Scott and I were talking afterwards. Scott goes, "Man, I got this concept about taking these notes and going." Yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, mm -hmm. "I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna put something together." And voila, two books later, here it is. Yeah. And are you getting any royalties because you were part of that conversation? Oh, plenty. My yeah, gosh. Right? Yeah. He's <laughs> you, just wheelbarrowing it to me. Right. You got a discount on your first uh, purchase from him, right? Right. <laughs> um, okay. So let's talk about your trumpet playing for a second. Uh, where, where'd you start uh, college? Where'd you go I'm, for your bachelor's? I'm from, um, I'm from upstate New York. I'm from Binghamton, New York. You don't uh, have an accent. You can't be from there. No, well, I mean, you don't sound like it. Look how long it's been since I've been out here, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm actually from Endicott, but no one knows where that is. So we say Binghamton, and people from Binghamton are Tony Cadlick. I grew oh, up yeah. with him. Yeah. Uh, Steve Davis, the trombone player. Dina DeRose, the singer. Uh, Rick DePoffey, who's since passed, record producer. And uh, uh, John, uh, Mike Holliber was there. Beautiful writer in New York. Al Hom was a director. And so we had this vibrant community of maybe like 200,000 people with two jazz clubs. Hmm. And this one guy was really supportive. His name was Glenn Gardner. And he had it so that, you know, the drinking age back then, Larry, when I was growing up, was 18. Mm -hmm. And you can go into a club when you were 18 years old. And mm -hmm. It was a great time to be coming up. And I learned a lot from so many people. Mm -hmm. Uh, from there, from there, yeah, I went to engineering school. 
two years of engineering school. I was going to transfer. I went to um, SUNY Binghamton, uh, got a degree in uh, uh, in engineering, a two year degree with a with an intent to transfer. Is this like got, electrical, mechanical? What, what I haven't time? chosen yet. Okay. It's probably going to be closer to computer, mm -hmm. and you'll see that story is coming up in a second. Mm -hmm. But I got the summer job where I had to go in. Uh, to this company and wear a smock and dress in a 65 degree controlled climate. And we had computer chips that were like this big back then. They were huge. Right. And my job was looking through a microscope to identify any of the defects. There were 24 points. After about two months of that, I said, I'm not going to be able to make it, man. I just can't yeah. make it. And that's when yeah. my buddy, Rick Poppy said, hey, I'm going to Berkeley in the fall. You want to go? Hmm. Yep. I want to go. I want to get out of here. I want to get out of this life. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm trying to draw a comparison between engineering and arranging, composing. Well, I think you get a better comparison by doing this. Um, so after I went to Berkeley, I got out. I did some road bands. I went to Arizona. I got accepted into Arizona State as a computer science major. Mm-hmm. I was working on Unix. I was studying C programming had just come out and Pascal, all those things. And I think the comparison to arranging comes from computer programming. I think there's a lot in common mm -hmm. because you have to separate, you have to make all these little things return to the big, to the big, the big idea. Mm -hmm. And it was very intriguing, but I kept hanging out at the music department, man. And finally, the, the director down there, Chuck Moronic, man, probably saved my life, took me out for coffee. And he goes, what are you doing, man? Go play. Go play. You know, just go play. And. Uh, OK, I, I, I'm going to interject something here. Um, I use this transcription program for these. And I, I'll, once we're done here, I'll upload it through this, this transcription program. And it's like. 60% accurate. Uh huh. Okay. So you just said the word Unix. Yeah. And what it's going to do is going to E U N I C H S. That's what it's going to translate. So it's when you U -N -I -X. said Unix, you went to Arizona to work on Unix. And if I leave the transcript <laughs> just like that, I, I think that's, that's Don't probably. Leave it like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. That's Sorry. Uh, in that, um, I, I can't get around that. I mean, it. Uh, well, right. there are a lot of things I can't talk about right now the way it trans transcribes. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. when did you start, speaking of transcribing, when did you actually start lifting stuff off records? Oh, back in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I always tried to lift stuff I couldn't play. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, but I, but I listened a lot. And by listening... You know, remember back then, I don't know, you're not as old as I am, but we, I, I did everything off a turntable. Mm -hmm. So. We're close. How old are you? I'm going to be 64. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're older. Yeah, I know. And um, so I would, I would have this turntable and I would slow it down to 33, you know, and I'd be able to listen to everything. So it started with a melody line mm -hmm. and then it started with bass. I always transcribe the bass to try to get the chords, listen to the piano player. What are they playing? I sit down at the piano third and seventh and what's the quality of the chord, you know? And then after I moved up and I was able to actually, you know, do some big band stuff, get all the lead lines, mm -hmm. get all the lead trumpet, the lead trombone, the, the lead alto, mm -hmm. and then go from there and try to fill in the spots. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot by listening. I probably should have been playing, you know, Schlossberg and uh, Clark and Arbins back then. Yeah. But yeah, uh, so I when you know. talk about when you yeah. talk about big bands, are you talking about uh, bands from the 30s, 40s? Like the that's where I bands? started. Yeah, that's where I started because you know, the, you know, every band ended on a major six chord. That was easy. <laughs> Boom! Gah, right there. Mm -hmm. And moved out. You know, I got really interested by Boyd Rayburn. I don't know and, that name. Yeah, the Boyd Rayburn band was so ahead of its time, and I, I got into that. I actually went down the path of, you know, Larry, the reason why I never really, I never had a lot of confidence in my trumpet playing. And That's I'll just surprising. Say, I'll just say it right now. You know, I, I never had a lot of confidence in it. And 
I had the person who really helped me out the most, to tell you the truth, uh, was John Alamo. No kidding. At IU. When I first got to IU, John had just started. Mm -hmm. And um, I walked into his studio, said, you know, John, I hear, I can hear everything. I got so much stuff in my head. It just won't come out this end the way I want to hear it. John goes, all right, I know exactly what to do. And he did. He mm -hmm. knew exactly what to do, you know. And I had, I had an elbow problem. And I don't know how to explain it. I was holding the horn at an angle and my mm -hmm. elbow would hurt, you know, really hurt. And we corrected that. So, I mean, of all the teachers, trumpet teachers, I studied with Lou Mucci at Berkeley. He was great. Mm -hmm. We played duets together. I learned so much from him. But John is the real, is the one who really dove into the, the stuff that I really needed. Mm -hmm. The basic stuff on how to set myself up right for success. Mm -hmm. Great teacher. And uh, isn't it funny? I mean, you know, everybody that you study with is has uh, a major influence in some way, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, you get information that you're not ready to, or you just don't understand yet. So, uh, and I'm saying that because, like, my first teacher, Vince DiMartino, and I say that every, yeah. you know, every time. Sure. Um, I mean, it's hard to beat Benny. I mean, you know, he's he's terrific. Yeah, but but every time I've I've gone to work with somebody else, it's like they've they've shown me uh, another another route, uh, another way to think about things. Uh, Bobby Shu being one of those. Who mm -hmm. you know, I think Bobby's brilliant. Uh, I took a couple to, lessons from Bobby. Yep. As and you know, if you want to talk anatomy and physiology, he's your guy. He knows. Right. Yep. You know. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm trying to get back on track here. What were we talking about? Um, uh, we were talking oh, about oh. anything but the trumpet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I want to go back to you. You said you had, were lacking confidence, and I don't know yeah. that that's true these days, is it? No, not so much these days. I, I pretty much know who I am by mm -hmm. this age, you know, and I know what I play like, and I know mm -hmm. I know what gigs to take and what gigs not to take. Mm -hmm. um, I know I can sound good in any jazz setting, big band or small group is my specialty. I know a lot of tunes. Um, I function really well as a second trumpet player in a brass quintet, mm -hmm. as long as I have someone to follow who I know, because I play the trumpet in tune, you know, and I, mm -hmm. I work on all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, you're not going to put me on a you're not going to put me on that or you're not going to put me in. I remember a couple of times I got hired by the, you ready for this? The ISO, the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. And I said, are you kidding me? And it was for, it was Florence Henderson. Oh, nice. You know, playing, playing third Trump. And I walked in, I said, guys, I really appreciate the call, but I mean, everybody must be working here. You know? Um. Okay, so what was this? Two, three weeks ago, uh, you were sharing the stage with John Raymond, jazz yes, yes, teacher down yes. at IU, uh, uh -huh. Joey Tartell, yep. and Rex Richardson was in town. So right. the four of you uh, on stage with a, an unbelievable rhythm section behind right. you. Right, yep. Those, those guys were amazing. That was my Ball State rhythm section, except for Luke Gillespie. He was from okay. uh, IU, yeah, and I've known Luke for like, God since 93 you know yeah so you know i know joey's playing i've heard joey play a lot i've mm -hmm. i know rex is playing i've heard mm -hmm. rex play you know everything from uh rhythm I know, and brass yeah. back yes. in the days yeah um this first time i heard john yeah. what a what a great sound yes uh yeah and i heard you and i'm like you know it's uh, and you're uh, like what's he doing up there no. <laughs> and then and it's like, well, no. he wrote the book no, no, that's, that's, that's why not what I was here. thinking at all. Well, you know, I'm thinking, first of all, four really uniquely different players. You know, you all have different ideas. Uh, but it, it, everybody sounded great. Oh, thank you. You know, it was, it was, the, it was I mean, a pretty special evening, you know, especially when you, and it's hard to go wrong again when you've got a rhythm section like that. I mean, yeah. I mean, I could have sounded good up there with that rhythm section. You know, well, here's the thing, like, when I put that, I've been think tossing that idea around. I'm always looking for new ideas. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's me. I always got something cooking, something I'm working on. Otherwise, what am I going to do? You know. Mm-hmm. So that I finally came through, and I didn't want it to be like a Bill Chase because that's what everyone mm-hmm. thinks of when you have four trumpets. Now mm-hmm. I used to, I loved Chase growing up, you know, all that's, but I wanted it to be something different. So I took into consideration everyone's abilities, mm-hmm. kind of like because I knew I knew all they're playing, and I mean you know Rex tore up Caravan. <laughs> Joey ridiculous. Joey sounded great on the bass trumpet. I wrote a lot of bass trumpet stuff for him. Mm-hmm. Um, John sounded great on a, the up tempo tunes, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, and I kind of paced it out so that everyone had a had their own kind of feature, you know. Mm-hmm. But thanks for saying that. No, it was great, and the charts they were great. I told you, but after that show, I said yeah, the, I the charts were about... charts were great. Thank um, you. I, I mean. And playable, like I feel like I could take those charts and that, I could do something with them. That's the thing, and I'm glad you said that because we don't have any time to rehearse. Mm-hmm. We had we had three o'clock to five o'clock to look the charts over, so I knew they couldn't be like you know Clifford's solo to like this tune harmonized four way. Although with those guys, probably, mm-hmm. you know, trumpet players are good readers, man. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying this to all your out. Trumpet players are really good readers. Mm-hmm. So uh, you remember Chappie, right? Marvin Perry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, he was principal trumpet of the ISO. But mm-hmm. I remember him telling me in lessons. He goes, you know, jazzers, trumpet players, jazzers have yeah. the best ears. Jazzers <laughs> hear things way better than classically trained uh, trumpet players. Mm-hmm. And I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Well, I mean, we, you know, you go, you stand up, you don't know what the heck you're going to play. And you got to do like a Star Wars moment. Luke, use the force. (laughs) And you got to give yourself over and you've got to fall flat on your face lots of times Mm -hmm. before you can relax enough to where you feel, ah. Yeah, I can make this. I can hear this. I can hear what they're playing. Mm-hmm. It takes time. Mm-hmm. As far as styles go, what, what's your yeah. most comfortable style to play in? Are you a bebop guy or are you? Um, no. Um, Is bebop even still a term? Am I like so far out of it that? No, I mean, bebop is a term. It. You know, it's it's a genre of music. Mm-hmm. Generally, faster tempos, mm-hmm. uh, virtuosic playing. I I like bebop. I like blues. I like um, ballads. I love ballads. Mm-hmm. I love brass quintet. I love to play in a brass quintet. And uh, I did. I got to play in one this summer with Clark Hunt. Oh yeah. And. Uh, Oh, that was really that was really nice. Rich Dole was playing, mm-hmm. so it was a lot of fun. I love being able to blend. You know, he's using a C trumpet. I'm using a B flat. Yeah, I you mentioned Rich. Rich is one of those guys that I think goes so seamlessly between the jazz and the classical world. He's he sounds great on bass trombone. Uh, you know, with the ISO, I sat yeah. in front of him a few times there, and yeah. then you know I hear him play in a big band i'm like that's that's not fair <laughs> supposed to great. struggle somewhere yeah he's a great trombone player mm-hmm. you know I, I feel the same way about um a couple other people like uh joey tartell lenny mm-hmm. foy lenny mm-hmm. foy is one of these guys i can go yeah i you know i sat i sat next to lenny this morning uh we we're both playing an iso show uh tomorrow. oh oh nice and, okay yeah and you're right i mean lenny lenny yeah. sounds great Yep. And uh, so my favorite style is, look, my favorite style is playing with a quartet. Mm -hmm. I love playing with a Mm -hmm. jazz quartet or a quintet, you know, a small group. Mm -hmm. Yep. And a a combination of standards and stuff you've written, right? Stuff I've written, originals, standards, any kind of thing. I mean, I'll go do like a like I, I got called by these young kids from IU to play at the Chatterbox in April. I know I'm not going to make any money, but I'm going to have a heck of a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Mm-hmm. 
you were kind of the the catalyst for the first Jazz Fest, I think. Is that right? Weren't you part of organizing? Jazz Fest nine, nine, uh, 99, I believe, wasn't it? Mm. Wasn't it 1999? It was yeah. a big deal. Look at this. I'm looking at the poster right here. See it? Huh. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, 1999. There it is. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a big deal. I, I, I mean, I worked on the outside of it. I wasn't really the person who pulled the strings. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yours was the the name that I remember and associated with that. Uh, but obviously, you had a lot to do with that. Well, I mean, I made some recommendations. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, we we the Buscelli Waller of Jazz Orchestra played at the Jazz Fests many years, mm -hmm. many years. I remember this one time we were playing in Slidehampton was the mm -hmm. was the guest artist and Larry Wiseman, me, I think it was Jeff Conrad. I forgot who the other. We got lost because we were listening to Slide play <laughs> so beautifully. Right. Oh my God! It was Steve Ali's band. Mm -hmm. uh, we we committed the cardinal sin. We listened to the the soloist. He was mm -hmm. oh my god, playing so beautifully. Mm -hmm. I remember that night. I got to play with him, slide Buddy DeFranco. Mm -hmm. So the good memories. Um, you probably yeah, tell, tell me. I want to follow that thread. Tell me some more of these. You know, first experiences or experiences <clears throat> with great great bands, well, great players. The very first big time job. I, I got, I got, I literally got fired. Let me tell you about this. This is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. I auditioned at the Brookline Country Club in Boston for this hotel gig up in New Hampshire. There were six trumpet players there. We had to uh, sight read, we had to um, improvise, and we had to fake some tunes. Sight read, no problem. Improvise, no problem. This is where this is where the next thing I was kind of worried about the faking tunes. At that time, I knew ten tunes, and I am not kidding you. I hit a royal flush, man. He called four tunes, and I knew them. They were from my <laughs> ten tunes, right? Yeah, yeah. Here I am up making second parts to him. You know, he was a saxophone player, mm -hmm. and I got the gig. Mm -hmm. Well, our first, my first gig. We're standing around a piano. It was the old time society where you played for 25 minutes straight. Mm -hmm. You would play like the, the saxophone player would play the melody. The trombone player would play the bridge. The saxophone player would finish the melody. And the trumpet player would go to the piano player like this, like two flats or two sharps for the next mm -hmm. tune. So the sax player the, comes up to me. He goes, now, look, you haven't done this before. If you don't know the tune, don't play. Ain't no problem. 25 minutes goes, I played on one tune. We took a break and he comes over. He goes, what's the matter? And I said, oh, nothing. This is great. How come you're not playing? And I said, because you said, if I don't know the tune, don't play. <laughs> and he goes, I thought you knew all the tunes. And when I told him what had happened at the oh, audition, no. <laughs> he goes, I would fire you right now, but I can't get anyone to come up for the summer. So here's what I'm going to do. He put 30 tunes on my door every week mm. from May to October. 30 tunes a week. And I laugh sometimes when I think about some of these students I can't learn for 14 tunes in a semester. Right. You know, 30 tunes in a week I learned for one year. And mm. it happened again the second year. And mm. I knew so many tunes, man. And we're not talking just like reading down the chart. We're talking by heart learning these things by heart yeah no yeah. there's no music no music involved at mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. yeah knowing the knowing the bridge was the heart i mean, used to take the bridge to like from have you met miss jones and put it on like you know another tune mm -hmm. and oh man that was really frustrating <laughs> um what possessed you to take that audition i mean you you probably didn't know um, I, I didn't know. And I, you're right. I didn't know anything about it. All I know is I wanted to take anything that came my way. Mm -hmm. So I took the audition, landed the gig, spent a couple summers up there. So, I mean, obviously he wasn't on you every night, or right? I mean, you were, you were making well, progress. You were learning too. He, he was seeing I was making progress, mm -hmm. you know, but every once in a while he felt that it was his duty to uh, put his boot somewhere. You know, 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, it was probably the best thing that happened to me. Yeah. You know? Uh, who were you listening to at that point? Well, oh, here's a good story for you. At that point in my life, I really got into Chet Baker. Hmm. And in 19, um, this is 1981, I got to see Chet Baker play. And, uh, and I went up to see him play. Mm -hmm. And um, he's playing with his quartet. He sounds okay. He sounds like he didn't warm up. The break happens. He's over in the corner. Here I am, uh, 23 years old, maybe 22. I go up to him, and Mr. Baker, wow, my name's not. I really like the way you play that, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me and he goes, oh, let's go outside. I said, okay. So we're outside in the parking lot walking around. I Here I am. I'm walking with Chet Baker, right? Mm -hmm. And he looks at me. He goes, what would you bring me? And of course, I, Let's Get Lost came out in 1984. If you've never seen that movie, there's one to watch. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him. I said, well, I didn't bring you anything. And he looks at me and he goes, F you. And he turns around <laughs> and walks away. And here I am, 21 years old, just got told to, you know, F you by the guy I've been listening to. And I didn't even want to go back in, man. I, didn't, uh -huh. I, don't, I think I just left. It's pretty disheartening. And then the same year, I got to see Miles Davis pull up in his yellow Ferrari at Kicks in Boston with Al Foster and Bill Evans on sax and Marcus Miller. And I got to sit in the sixth row back mm -hmm. and I got to see Miles come out in a white painter's outfit. And the thing that blew my mind and probably changed my life the way I viewed playing on stage, mm -hmm. Miles walks up to Bill Evans. And I could hear every word he was saying. And he goes, I pay you to practice. And he is, you know, MF. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, whoa. And it just hit me like Bill was playing some incredible stuff that I didn't hear. But probably Miles had heard it so much. He's telling him, take some chances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that was that that changed a lot of the way I thought about playing on stage, mm -hmm. playing jazz. Oh, uh, speaking of stages, what what phase was he in musically, Miles? I think he had just come back. He wasn't playing a lot of trumpet. He was playing a lot of keyboards. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think that was his comeback. Um, I may be wrong about this, but it was the year of nineteen, I believe, eighty or eighty one. Mm -hmm. Was in it was with that band. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to stand in line and see Miles get out of a yellow Ferrari, you know, and I wasn't going to say anything because I was pretty close to him because I didn't want to have it happen twice. Like, shut the, you know. Well, I mean, were you prepared at least? Did you have something that he said, what did you bring me? Had, would you, no, 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 no. I didn't do that, man. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I kind of look like uh, at getting cussed out by Chet Baker as a, as a badge of honor. Man, I would, I would, I would wear a T, I would make a T-shirt and wear that all the time. I got because I got flipped off by Charles Barkley. No kidding, really? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's a fun little story. But you know, it's like I thirty years later, for, or you know, I'm still it's like I'm proud of that. You know. Yeah, but you had. I mean, you weren't aspiring to be a an NBA basketball player, <laughs> no, were you? No no, no. <laughs> no, no. This was when he was still playing for Auburn. You know, he was it was college ball. Okay. And and I was at UK and the pet band and we just oh, harassed yeah. we harassed everybody. Right. And uh, you know, we were we were giving them and this was when the band was right behind the visitors bench. Yeah. And and he had had enough. He just turned around. I don't think he said anything, but you know, he gave us Sure. Mr. Yeah. Luke. It was great. Yeah. We and of course, you know, yeah, we all cheered. It was great. So see, I'm saying uh Again, but what a great memory. How many other people can say that they got uh, got spoken to like that <laughs> by Chet Baker? I don't know, man. I, I don't know, but uh, that was the Badge of Honor. Time. Yeah, it was Badge the of Honor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, there's so many players. I, you know, I could wish, there are a lot of things I wish I could have. I would have, wish I had taken the opportunity to go hear Bud Herseth. There was never an excuse to not get to Chicago. I just, 
I just didn't do it. Now it's yeah. too late. You know, mm -hmm. same thing with, with so many other great players. It's like, oh, which now, you know, with this podcast, I think I'm trying to make up for, <laughs> make up for that, you know, getting to meet some really great players. Yeah, um, you're, I've listened to a lot of the interviews, you know, um, good stuff, man. Good stuff. I, well, it's nice to find background and, you know, how people view different ways of practicing. And the more I, the more I listen to, to all of the people talk, the, you know, the more everyone has this kind of the same story. We're all in this because we're still learning. Mm -hmm. We're still learning new ways to play or new ways to write, new ways mm -hmm. to do this. And, you know, I got to tell you, I really love my job at college. There's days I don't love it. You know, obviously the administrative stuff, but I mean, I love working with that talented students who mm -hmm. want to be there. Mm -hmm. They come in and they expect, you know, you're, I play a lot of duets with them. Um, it keeps me on my toes. Mm -hmm. And the job itself is, is, I was kind of scared to be the boss at first because, you know, it's a lot of responsibility. We got, six people now that I have to, I have to try to keep the, the program growing and all that. Mm -hmm. But I make sure that I have communication. I think that's, that's why I've been married for 28 years. I mean, communication mm -hmm. is, is the number one thing and mm -hmm. making sure that everyone knows I'm not trying to hide anything from you. This is what's coming. This is where we're at. And this is what we need to do. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I mean, that goes way beyond music, right? I mean, these are these are kind of lessons that college kids need to learn. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Life skills, life skills, how to get along with people, how to how to meet someone or remember their name. You know, how how to uh, I mean, it goes. It's so much more than look how fast I can play. Mm -hmm. You know, the H, the higher, faster, louder. Man, I've made a living on the LSS podcast. Lower. Slower, softer. <laughs> that's what I, that's my mantra, man, my whole life. Yeah. You know, and I still play the trumpet and I can still, I don't feel intimidated when I'm playing next to uh, great players anymore because I know that I mm -hmm. have something to say. It may not be as many words as they have, but I can still say what I need to say at this point. I can get mm -hmm. out what I hear. Mm -hmm. And it's getting better all the time. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Uh, um, what age were you when you started? Oh, God, man. I started on the French horn in fourth grade. Now we're done. Sw we're done. Switched to the trumpet in fifth grade because the French horn looks, well, you know. It wasn't cool to carry on the bus. <laughs> um, you're still okay. I was asking who you were listening to during uh, during that time back around. Uh, you were talking about Miles and Chet. Yeah, I mean, who's, I love Clifford Clark Terry. I love Clark Terry. Clark. Terry. Um, I'm curious to who who you're listening to these days. I mean, who really kind of lights things up for you? Well, you know, um, I love listening to Emmett's Place on Monday nights because he has all kinds of players come in that I've never heard of before. And I'm like, you know, writing people's names down and jotting stuff down. And I keep my ears open to uh, a lot of people. And I try to keep my ears open to the older guys, too, that around my age, like Joe Magnarelli, I lo love his playing. Mm -hmm. um, John Swana. You know, um, love his playing. Um, I love um, Mark um, Marquise Hill. Mm -hmm. His his playing is just so lyrical and beautiful. And Terrell Stafford, man, to yeah. me, to me, Terrell Stafford does it. Mm -hmm. He's got the sound. He's got the feel. He's got the range, and he's got the soul. Mm -hmm. You know, I love his playing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you, and I of course, you were when when Winton came out, I mean, I was at Berkeley and Brantford Marcellus was there at the time that I was there. I actually got to play with him for like a month in a quintet. Nice. And uh, yeah, it was really nice. But, you know, at the time, Brantford was brand. He was a saxophone player at Berkeley. And then he went on the road with Art Blakey and he came back nine months later and did a recital. And everyone went, oh, my God. And I walked up and said, 
man, what have you been doing? He goes, you get your butt kicked by Art Blakey every night. This is what happens. And mm -hmm. I said, wow. And I heard Wynton Marcellus when he was maybe 16 or 17 years old. Mm -hmm. He came to Berkeley. He was at a practice room. And I happened to be there that night. And these students came down. Man, you got to check this out. You got to check this out. I went down. I couldn't get in the room because there were too many people. But I put my ear against the glass at the door. Mm -hmm. And I heard this kid play Donna Lee at a blistering tempo and play four choruses of circular breathing. Mm -hmm. And I just <laughs> walked out of there and saying, what did I just hear? Mm -hmm. You know, what did I just hear? And then, and then, um, remember, uh, who's the trumpet player from Russia? Sergei well, yeah, I was just going to bring that up. That's the same thing. I remember it was the 2010 or 2011, I think it was. And, yeah. Uh, Sergei came to ball state. It was only his only American, um, appearance and i'm in the audience and i look and there's this bald head in front of me about three rows up and i walk up and i go lou mm -hmm. and he turns around and he goes who are you i'm mark Buscelli. i work up here as lou soloff mm -hmm. and he goes well can i come back and see what he got to talking to me and he told me the story of how he played a tape for winton marcellus over the phone he said listen to this guy man and it was the 13 year old Sergei playing, mm -hmm. but Wynn didn't know it. And Wynn goes, Who's that, man? And he goes, It's a 13 year old kid from Russia. He said, The next day my phone rang, and he goes, That's Wynn saying, I think I'm just going to play jazz. <laughs> Lou Soloff told this to me. Yeah. Right. That was the same weekend that Arturo came down. He had been up in Fort Wayne. Yes, he had been and, up in Fort Wayne. And he came down. He and Sergey had a, a, a Man, horn love fest, right? I mean, uh, they well, I was there, and they they okay. So here's the story, and you know, I, I got off to a wrong foot with Arturo at Butler, but I'm not going to tell that story now. But it's it's all cool now. Um, well, I don't think anybody can get off on the right foot with him. From yeah, what I heard. right. I'll edit so, that out. Yeah, but he's he has matured. He's he's mellowed out. Anyways, to to make a story longer. Um, he was over in this corner going, Brrr, and here's Sergei over in this corner going, oh, Brrr, oh. they met at the middle of the room. Oh, man, I'll never forget this. Mark Van Cleve was there, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, Arturo goes, uh, what do you think? I think the lesson should be. And Sergei goes, low notes. And Arturo goes, oh, low notes. Yeah, and of course, Arturo's got a pretty, really nice pedal range, right? Right. Mm -hmm. He plays, you know. Sergei picks up the trumpet, man. Look, I'm still getting goosebumps. It's been like, what, 12 years? Right. right. And he starts playing these pedal tones, and he sounds like a bass trombone player in a symphony orchestra. I could not believe what I was hearing, man. Mm -hmm. And Arturo was like, whoa. It was just amazing. And then I remember Sergei going, oh, my chops, I feel a little stiff. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, dude, man, I'll take one of those chops. Right. You know? Right. That's so great. So and what and Sergei Nakarikov is such a wonderful human being, Larry. He yep. got in his limousine to go to the airport and he made the limousine stop in the middle of the road and he ran all the way across the grass up to the door, gave me a hug and thanked me. Thank you so much for a great weekend. And he ran mm -hmm. back and got in his limo. I said, He didn't have to do that, man. He did not have to do that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's that's something else I found of it with with being able to talk to all these people is, um, you know, they're great players, but there are just some really fantastic people, human beings out there. Yeah. And yeah. And the one that comes to mind, who I think is just, who thinks so deeply, Byron Stripling. Yeah, I think is oh, my hero. Man. Because Byron. I mean, is, yeah. You know, he's got a great perspective on humanity. He's he's in touch with with that. Yes, and of is. course, you know, you can't you can't. And I think he's one of the best entertainers, not just trumpet players, best entertainers. You know, I should have put Byron in that list of people that I say I love. I had him as a guest artist at mm -hmm. Ball State and he does the whole thing. Man. He mm -hmm. plays the crap out of the trumpet. Mm -hmm. He improvises beautifully. He plays the trumpet. And you're right. He's a wonderful entertainer. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't sell it short. It's all him. 
This is him. This is his personality, you know? Yeah, you know, what I like about one of the other things on, on the playing side is that uh, he's helping keep not that Louis Armstrong needs help uh, being, you know, right. Uh, yeah. Um, but like him and Bria Sconberg. Yeah. You know, doing, oh, doing their up, up too. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. She's she's she was a lot of fun to talk to as well. But um, so let's spend some more time talking about other people uh, in yeah. your interview. Sure, man. <laughs> Whatever you want to do. Yeah. Um, man, I'm just t- trying to think, of course, we're not going to get to everything. Um, you know, we're, what, do you have hobbies? Here's a stock question for you. Do you have any hobbies? Anything other yeah, than music? Yeah, I do have hobbies. Um, I love to play golf. I like to play poker. Um, I like to work out. Mm-hmm. And uh, like you, I mean, man, I remember, I remember you, man. How much weight have you lost? A hundred pounds. It's got to be a hundred pounds. A hundred and eighty. Oh my god! Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, and, I'm okay. I'm literally and, half. And I imagine that because you lost all that weight, you had trouble playing the trumpet. Because I hear that from a lot of people where they they don't know how to play the trumpet anymore because that that's it's how not Bobby. There. That's how Bobby Shue became my my teacher. Bobby's been working with me for about ah, a year. There you go. Yeah. 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 I, I just talked to him uh, a little bit yesterday. Uh, you know, more questions uh, about the whole thing, and you know that's you know that I can call it Bobby Shue. You know. Yeah. Is is pretty cool. And the thing is, is he's like, yeah, anytime, anytime. You know, he, the guy wants to help. Yeah. And uh, I love that. You know, it's like. I know sometimes we put these people on pedestals, right? Yep. And and we're afraid to talk to him, but it turns out that, you know, like like Bobby, he just wants to help. Yeah. So. I mean, you know, Larry, you said, do I have any hobbies? I like to write music. That's a hobby of mine. It happens yeah. to also be a profession, yeah. you know? It's nice when the two, two meet up. I like to read books. Um, and I love to spend time with my wife. Mm-hmm. So... Um, it was like I said before we started the interview. And she was delightful. Um, and she was a ballet dancer, right? Did I remember that correctly? She was a ballet dancer. No, turned into a, a physical therapist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I'm just trying. Oh, ballroom dancing. That's right. I asked her about that. <laughs> she said, "Yeah." She. I was said, "Okay." Yeah. We. We. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> We took ballroom dance lessons, right? Yeah. Look, we're musicians. We have rhythm. I have rhythm. You have rhythm. It's not good enough for a dancer, though. I mean, uh, she ended up, like, leading all the time. (laughs) You know? It's like, all right, look, I know I'm out of my element here, Mm. you know, but you got to let me try to lead. That's the Mm. only way I'm going to learn is if you let me lose control. Let the control, let it go. It's like playing on stage, you know, let it go. It's one of the most exciting. Larry, I love, I love just standing up and with a quartet or, you know, just letting it all out, man. Mm-hmm. You never know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I, w- I would say I'm, I'm grateful that I got to witness that just a few weeks ago, right? And, yeah, and, it was just a few weeks jazz, ago. Yeah. And the Jazz Kitchen's a nice, intimate place to to see that. You know, it's not like... You know, that gig was scheduled two years ago. Uh, three uh, years ago. Yeah. Sorry. Three years ago. But idiot me scheduled it on the night of the Super Bowl, not realizing <laughs> it until a week before. And the kitchen owner, Dave, calls me up. He goes, uh, do you realize we scheduled this gig on the Super Bowl? He goes, no one's going to be here. Mm. So Rex Richardson ended up spending a night in the Indianapolis hotel doing nothing. Watching the Super Bowl, I hope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, th- this has been great. You know, I, like I said at the beginning, this is most we've probably talked, but um, I love learning about, you know, not just you, but what you've contributed to the musical scene here in Indianapolis, which is pretty tremendous. No, you thank know. you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, really do. and uh, you know the few times we do get to sit together, 
uh, in a recording studio doing right. Hal Leonard marching band stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, time to put on the doubler, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's. It, I'm grateful that uh, I got an interview with you finally, and uh, yeah, yeah, thank I, you, Larry. Thank you yeah. very much. Um, so let me wrap up here. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll do my usual thanks to the sponsors again. Let me throw those guys up here. Uh, of course, uh, I'll go from the bottom this time. Pickett Blackburn, Austin Custom Brass, Messina Covers, Chop Saver, Hammond Design, Eastman, S.E. Shires. Um, hey, are you affiliated with uh, any any brand, any company? Yeah, I have a Messina uh, a bag that I love. It's just sitting right right here. Yeah. Right here, yeah. Yeah, I Dave and it. Erica. Oh, they're great. Yeah, yeah. I met them up at uh, Trumpet Day at Ball State when Stephen mm -hmm. Campbell had his Trumpet Day up there, mm -hmm. and they were up there with their cases. So, yeah. and of course, Chop Saver, man. Right. Dan Gosling. I mean, come on, great trumpet player, who also makes lip balm, who has a fantastic wife, Noel, that my wife loves, and my daughter studied violin with her for years. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And he's a great entrepreneur. He's been a, a yes. huge help for me the last few years. Yep. Yeah. So, well, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And, uh, okay, everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, let's see. Next week is Morris Northcutt. It's, it's going to be a huge left turn from the jazz world. Right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us. Uh, Mark, stay there for just a second, and I'm okay. going to sign us out.